I believe we finished our conversation last week with the discussion of biogeochemical cycles. And today we will talk a little bit. We're going to start talking about microbial communities. As you can imagine, microorganisms um, practically never live alone. They live in what we call shared habitats in the communities. And in these communities, microbes tend to interact with each other. These interactions can be beneficial to both parties. They can be harmful to one of the parties. Or sometimes they can be neutral. Some of these relationships can be obligatory. And we generally refer to these obligatory relationships in the communities as symbiosis. Some relationships are not obligatory, although they may or may not benefit the participants. And first I want to chat with you about main terms regarding different types of symbiotic relationships. The first type of typical symbiotic relationship is mutualism. Mutualism refers to a partnership between microorganisms and is mutually beneficial. Let's say you have a microorganism A that produces nutrient 1. This nutrient 1 is necessary for successful growth of the microorganism B. And microorganism B in turn produces nutrients 2 which is necessary for the survival of microorganism A. Do you see that mutualistic relationship? You remove one of the participants of the pair from that pair and the community basically falls apart. We're clear? Second type of symbiosis is commensalism. In commensal relationships, one microorganism receives the benefits, and we call this microorganism commensal, and co-inhabitant, bless you, and co-inhabitant is a neutral party in this situation. It isn't harmed, but it doesn't benefit it as well. You may have heard before the expression human commensal bacteria that refers to microorganism, microorganisms living in the human gut or on the human skin. So that term, human commensal bacteria, implies that bacterial species, they reap certain benefits from, say, be present in the human colon, but humans are neutral. Turns out this term was introduced decades ago when all the beneficial roles for bacteria in the gut were not really clearly outlined. Does that make sense to you? So it would be more appropriate now to call those bacteria mutualistic because as they receive benefits from, you know, being protected in the gut, having a constant source of nutrients, and so on, so we receive the benefits for, um, from basically bacteria shaping, properly shaping human immune system to some bacterial species allowing us to digest certain foods. Um, one of my favorite examples is the fact that human uh, enzymes are unable to digest seaweed and the fact that we can actually digest seaweed, which is a part of sushi rolls, it, we owe to bacteria that can break it down so we don't get indigestion. One of the uh, great examples of commensal relationships in the bacterial communities is satellitism. Satellitism is a, a subspecial case of commensal relationships. 
let me explain what I mean. So imagine that this is the gar plate. And this streak in the center is some kind of a microorganism that produces certain nutrient. And this nutrient diffuses away from the streak. Now, a microorganism that would require uh, this nutrient to grow will be found next to the initial streak. Does that make sense? I deliberately used red and blue colors to show that those are two very different species. And obviously, if you remove the blue microbes, it's not going to change anything for the red one because it still can grow. But if you remove the red microbe, the blue one will be unable to grow. Does that make sense to you? So in this case, blue microorganism is commensal. And red microorganism is co-inhabitant. Since we are mostly focusing on the clinical aspects of microbial life, we're interested mostly in parasitic relationships. Now, in parasitism, of course, provides the environment and the nutrients, basically supports the metabolism of the parasite. Any microbial invasion that is clinically relevant is an example of parasitism, whether we're talking, you know, influenza virus infection or bacterial skin infection or, I don't know, protozoan arthritis. Does that make sense? Because in all cases, the parasitic microorganism uses the host, humans, as the source of nutrients and is the site for replication. You have to understand that in case of parasitism, not every time the host suffers. Do you understand? One of my favorite examples is infection with anelloviruses, which affects virtually every person in the world population. It causes no side effects, no pathology to a human as far as we know it. So apparently, this type of parasitic relationship does not really hurt host. Microorganism just uses host metabolic products and metabolic processes. Does that make sense? Now, there are different types of parasites. Um, first of all, some parasites can be obligate, meaning that these microorganisms cannot exist outside of parasitic relationships. For instance, all viruses are obligate parasites. Um, majority of helminths, clinically relevant helminths, are obligate parasites. They cannot exist outside of the host. Whether it's a human host or animal host, there are some exceptions. There's a worm called Strongyloides tercularis that can live and reproduce in the soil. But generally speaking, those parasites cannot live outside parasitic relationships. Some microorganisms are intracellular parasites. Take all those viruses. They are obligate intracellular parasites. And larger organisms, parasitic organisms, can be classified as endo, parasites on the inside, or ecto, parasites on the outside. Quick reference. Um, you may inquire what should we call a bacteria that cause skin infections. By consensus, we call them endo. Still, yeah, we still call them so. Uh, if we're talking about the invasion into the tissue, it's endoparasite.
So I understand that it's kind of, you know, debatable question. So it's basically a scientific consensus. If you have uh, fungal or bacterial infection of the skin with a, like skin penetration and growth in the skin, it is still endoparasite. So obviously, uh, bacteria, fungi, viruses, uh, protozoa, they all are endoparasites. All helminths that we're going to be talking about eventually are all endoparasites. What are ectoparasites? Can you name some of those? Ticks, perfect, yes. What else? Bleach, sure. My, unfortunately, much more frequent, especially in the daycare centers or elementary schools. Flies. Flies. Yes. Fleas are not that common, but fleas will be too. Scabies will be ectoparasite. Huh? Bed bugs. <sighs> yes. Well, those are two groups of species that people will never stop fighting over. <clears throat> Bed bugs and mosquitoes. Because ticks basically grow and reproduce only in conjunction with the host. Okay. Lice, absolutely ectoparasites. They must be on the host. Fleas, same story. You talk about mosquitoes. Well, they cannot reproduce without the host, but they can grow. Mosquitoes do not feed on blood. Mosquitoes feed on the sap, on the sugar. Blood is necessary for our production. Same goes for bed bugs. I mean, they can crawl around waiting for the next available host, but, you know, they cannot reproduce without the host. So I guess that makes them ectoparasites. They cannot reproduce outside of the parasitic relationships. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Now, Parasitism is the, now I want you to understand pretty clearly that when we use the term symbiosis, symbiosis doesn't have to be good, like for all participants. Parasitism is an example of symbiosis as well. Now, are there any relationships that aren't symbiotic? Yes, and those are non-obligatory, non-mandatory relationships. We call them synergism and antagonism. So synergism, it's a type of relationships in which two or more participants can grow independently. So they can grow independently, but when they are together, they benefit greatly. So these relationships, synergistic relationships, they aren't necessary for the survival of a microorganism. Does that make sense? But when they're together, their chances to survive increase greatly. Um, in terms of clinical application and in terms of um, synergistic, I would call it syn synergistic virulence, one of the great examples is influenza and um, pneumococcal pneumonia. Multiple studies demonstrated that Influenza greatly increases the reproduction of pneumococcus. And when the person with influenza is exposed to pneumococcus, the chance, chances of dying from either of the diseases are increased greatly. So this is the kind of, kind of synergism that I'm talking about. You see what I'm trying to say? Each microorganism can cause the disease which can be life-threatening, but when these two microorganisms go together, the chances of, you know, terrible end, much greater. And since we, and antagonism is the situation when free living species antagonize each other, basically kill each other, go to war with each other. The classic textbook example, of course, is the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming in 1925, I believe. I can never remember the year. Um, Fleming discovered the growth of fungus penicillium notatum on the 
Agar plate inoculated with Staph aureus. And it turned out that around the fungus, Staph aureus was dying. So fungus produced something that was killing Staph aureus. That's the typical antagonistic relationships. And analysis of those relationships is extremely important for identifying new antibiotics. And since we're talking about the microbial communities, we absolutely must talk about the biofilm. So generally speaking, microorganisms can grow either in the planktonic form, which is suspension. Um, when you used your liquid, when you inoculated liquid media in your previous experiments, you produce the planktonic growth, okay? Now, biofilm is the growth on the surface. It is much more frequent than planktonic growth of microorganisms. Relationships in the biofilm are usually mutualistic or commensal. So how is biofilm formed? It all starts with the cells that we call primary colonizers. They attach to a surface and start to produce, bless you, start to produce a substance that is called EPS, extracellular polymeric substance. EPS consists mostly of polysaccharides, but may include other biological macromolecules, such as lipids or proteins. If you want uh, an analogy to what EPS is, or, well, sort of functional explanation, think of extracellular polymeric substance as of slime layer or capsule that overgrew and spread away from the original cell. Does that make sense? It's like a cape that starts growing, covering the biofilm and the protective coating. And that is essentially the role for extracellular polymeric substances to protect. Protect against desiccation. Protect against phagocytosis or any other type of predation on bacteria. And that layer of extracellular polymeric substance makes biofilm uh, incredibly challenging to destroy. Now, what happens after EPS establishes the first layer of biofilm? EPS is like a goo. It is sticky. And it facilitates the adhesion of secondary colonizers which contribute to a growth of a biofilm. Just like any other community, biofilm cannot grow to unlimited size. It's basically, you know, arguing that you can stop 5 million people in the city of Mentor and it's going to be fine. You know, every location, every community has physical limits. So when cells in the biofilm reach critical density, quite literally, density, I mean, they start to interact physically, interact with each other. When they reach critical density, the cells start to produce so-called quorum sensing molecules. If you are unfamiliar with the word quorum, it basically means sufficient amount. Say, if you are some kind of a council or a committee which has 10 people and you have to vote on something, you've got to have a quorum. It can be different, you know, you may set the different level, but obviously, if you vote on something and there are 10 people in the committee and only four people are present, then whatever these four people decide, it's not legit. Because it's not, you know, it doesn't represent 
the vast majority of a committee. Does that make sense? So quorum sensing refers to exchange of chemical signals between members of the biofilm at the certain level of density that we call critical density. Uh, Gram-positive and gram-negative microorganisms produce distinctly different quorum-sensing molecules. Gram-positive microbes produce small peptides, while gram-negative produce homocerin lactone. Homocerin lactone is basically a derivative, or different derivatives, the same lactone ring of the amino acid homocerin. Do you have any idea why there is a distinct, these molecules are distinct between gram positives and gram negatives? Most likely. What's the difference between gram positive and gram negative microorganisms? The fundamental difference. Density. Huh? Cell wall. Cell wall structure, yeah. So apparently, either, you know, due to the certain transport restrictions, you've got to have homocerin lactone for communication between gram negatives and peptides would suffice for gram positives. Now what do these quorum sensing molecules do? Um, generally speaking, they alter gene expression of various genes. They're going to either be transported into the cell or interact with the receptors on the cell and one or other way they will alter gene expression, changing metabolic processes, changing the growth rate. Uh, they may trigger the production of virulence factors, which was shown fully formed biofilm may start producing virulence factors that individual cells do not produce. Um, they will actually stimulate their own production, which I think is pretty cool. This is called auto induction. Okay. They may slow down the growth, enable motility, so microorganisms can spread. So you can see that this community is much more sophisticated than microorganisms growing by themselves. Before we move on, any questions? Yes? Um, is this, like the EPS example, positive feedback then, where it's like, Sort of, yeah. Yeah. But if you think about it, EPS will be a positive feedback until the population reaches the critical density. And then because, it'll start. because then, you know, nutrients become sort of limited. There is a competition. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, uh, I want to. So, the biofilm story. Basically, this is the story of definitions. So, you have to be able to recognize, like, the roles for EPS. And for terms like mutualism, synergism, and so on and so forth, match the term of the description. You clear? So, we're going to be talking now about the requirements for microbial growth. The oxygen requirements, the temperature, the pH, the ionic strength, and so on. And we will start with the oxygen requirements. Up front, Things that you do and don't need to know. Things that you don't need to know are in the right column. Those are examples. You will not have a question. What are the oxygen requirements for growth of Micrococcus luteus? Did I make myself clear? You do need to be, you, you need to be able to recognize a type, one of five types of microorganisms based on given description of growth and you should be able to match the type of metabolism to oxygen requirements of microorganism. As we will proceed, this concept, the metabolism and oxygen requirements, will become more clear. We're going to start with the microorganism A, here, this is an obligate 
Arab. Do you understand the, the word obligate? Must, right? It's must. So obligate Arab must have oxygen, cannot grow without it. Now, if it must have oxygen, what type of metabolism do you think these microorganisms have? Huh? Aerobic respiration, yes. I'm going to put AR, aerobic respiration. Now, if you will inoculate, um, I want to make a, a, a note. When we were uh, inoculating liquid medium, okay, remember we looked at the growth, whether it's on top or on the bottom. But the problem with the liquid medium is that your cells, the bacterial cells, may actually sediment, they may precipitate to the bottom because of the gravity. Is that understood? So in this image, the medium, the hypothetical, not hypothetical, but the medium that is present in these five tubes is not actually liquid. It is a semi-solid medium, so-called thioglycolate medium. You don't need to know that. I'm just letting you know. So the unique feature of thioglycolate medium is that it provides a reducing environment inside, meaning that oxygen is actually available only here, only on top. Does that make sense? As you, if you will, you know, take a, some kind of a oxygen detecting probe and stick it into the medium, you will find out that in the thick, somewhere here or here, the concentration of oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen, progressively <coughs> decreases. We're clear. So, microorganism B, which grows in the tube B, is an example of obligate anaerobic. These microorganisms are basically killed by oxygen. They cannot grow in the presence of it. So cultivating of these microorganisms is extremely challenging. You gotta have special chamber for culturing them. This picture here shows you a chamber with a detector of the atmospheric pressure. You may see the packet inside, packet that contains chemicals absorbing oxygen or you can look back on that day on that bench over there and see a, a pickle jar can you see a pickle jar some of you may not see but there's a pickle jar there mm -hmm. take a pickle jar put the candle inside put your samples inside light up the candle close the lid seal it in two minutes you have anaerobic chamber okay it's not perfect but it's better than nothing. Okay? Good? Clear? Awesome. What type of my uh, blah, blah, blah. what type of metabolism? Obligate anaerobes. I will have. Anaerobic respiration or what's the third type that we talked about? Fermentation. Fermentation. Does that make sense? Now the microorganism under the letter C is one of the most interesting, I would say, a lot of clinical pathogens belong to that group. This group is called facultative anaerobes. And before we dissect what it means, first, the word facultative, what does that mean? If I will tell you that facultative is the opposite or antonym of obligate. Obligate means, okay, say again. Obligate. Uh, obligate means you must. Facultative means? It doesn't have it. It doesn't have to. It doesn't need it, right? 
So it may, like if I will tell you, you know, your class can be mandatory or your class can be facultative. If class is facultative, you don't have to take it. It's offered, but you don't have to take it. Does that make sense? So facultative and the role. Let's dissect the name first. It means that it can be anaerobic, right? But it doesn't have to. Now, what the hell does that mean? Let's take a look at the growth. Facultative anaerobes grow best where? Where there is an oxygen. Can they grow without it? Or, yeah. Do they grow just as well or worse? They grow worse. Okay, they grow worse, but they still can grow. Now, that's really fascinating. What, is it, what kind of metabolism do, they, do, you, do you think they will use in the presence of oxygen? Hmm? Aerobic, yeah. But when oxygen is gone, bingo. How? Oh, look, that's a simple question. What are the steps of aerobic respiration? Big steps. First is glycolysis, second, Krebs, cre cre and then ETC, right? What is the only step of fermentation, basically? Glycolysis. So what you do, you just shut down all the processes down after glycolysis, and you convert, I don't know, pyruvate to lactic acid. Does that make sense? So it's easy to do. We clear? Now you tell me why it grows best with oxygen. I'm going to give you a hint. Think about the efficiency of aerobic respiration versus fermentation. ATP numbers. What's the ATP number for aerobic respiration? Ballpark ish. Yeah. 30, yeah, 30, 38, yeah, 30 something. What's the total ATP yield for fermentation? Anyone? No, even less. Two. So yeah, you know, fermentation will give some ATP, not as much, so cell won't be able to grow as fast. Does that make sense? It will still be able to grow. Makes sense, right? So facultative anaerobes, in my opinion, are the coolest ones. Staphylococci and Trobacteriaceae, yes. So why is it classified as facultative anaerobe if it's normally aerobic because normally it's aerobic mm -hmm. but in order to tell them apart from obligate aerobes we call them okay facultative anaerobe. what does that mean it means it can be anaerobic mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to okay. that's the idea so i know that the name is somewhat counterintuitive but it highlights that unique feature that Oh, facult facultative anaerobe. Can they live in the presence of oxygen? Yeah, they actually thrive. But the name means that they can also grow in the absence of it. Okay. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I don't want to throw myself into the vortex of discussing different dietary choices. I'm a, I'm a carnivore, but... Well, um, okay, if you... Let's put it this way. If you want a comparison, if you want an analogy. If we do a regular agricultural practices with all the fertilizers and all that kind of crap, everything is going to grow best. You know, like, I don't know, you feed your cattle with corn it's going to be fat and juicy okay you do the grass feed they're not going to gain weight as fast they're still going to gain gain weight but not as fast does that make sense they, they they're not going to die but they don't have to have the um the oxygen they may survive without it does that make sense fourth type is pretty simple Aerotolerant anaerobes. Um, do they need oxygen? No, 
they can survive it though. What kind of metabolism they most likely have? Anaerobic. You're absolutely right. Uh, in this case, the majority of air tolerant anaerobes turn out to be fermenters. So they mostly fermenters or anaerobic respiration. Okay? Now the last one is, I like the name. So look where it grows. It grows close to the top, but not on top. So where this microorganism grows, let's say it's Campylobacter jejuni. Is there oxygen there? Yeah. Is there a lot of oxygen there? Not much. So we call those microorganisms microaerophiles. Micro means small, aero means air, file means loving. So these microorganisms can grow the very exact, very specific concentration of oxygen. And growing these microorganisms is a pain in the rear end. So usually they require somewhere between 1 and 10% oxygen. Okay. Now what kind of metabolism would they have? Aerobic. Aerobic, yeah. It's aerobic respiration. Probably less efficient, but still aerobic respiration. Now, Campylobacter jejuni, we're going to talk about it in a second as an example. Helicobacter pylori, causative agent of um, gastric ulcer, is the famous microaerophile. It took Marshall and Warren, as far as I remember, about two years to finally figure out the growth condition for the microorganism because they didn't know it was microaerophile. Um, there was a project, there's a... a microorganism called Xiella vernetii, which causes Q fever, very severe and honestly quite rare disease that is common in um, different parts of the United States, transmitted by ticks. Uh, it was thought to be an intracellular pathogen until one really, really stubborn grad student spent three years figuring out the oxygen requirements and managed to grow it on the plate the very exact concentration of oxygen. So we call those microorganisms Goldilocks. Does that make sense? So you can expect the question, like, you know, description of the oxygen requirements and what this is. Now, what else can contribute to the fact that some microorganisms are aerobic and some are anaerobes? Turns out, as we mentioned before, in the presence of oxygen, cells form so-called reactive oxygen species. Chemicals like superoxide anion or hydrogen peroxide. I don't know if you've heard a lot about superoxide anion, but I guess you have an idea about hydrogen peroxide and you know that we can use it to kill bacteria. So if bacteria produce chemicals that are toxic for them, they have to have the meaning to neutralize these chemicals. Are we clear? Um, I made a promise for you that I'm not going to ask you any chemical reactions in the course, and I'm going to stand by this promise. Reactions on the bottom are for illustration purposes only. It basically shows you the three chemical pathways in which this most notorious reactive oxygen species can be neutralized. Enzyme called peroxidase can neutralize hydrogen peroxide, converting it to water and some oxidized substrate. I don't know. Catalase, which is going to be a topic of our conversation, in a few minutes, can neutralize hydrogen peroxide, essentially bringing it down to water and oxygen. And extremely, extremely reactive superoxide anion can be neutralized to 
hydrogen peroxide, and oxygen by the enzyme called superoxide dismutate. So my only request for you to know is to know the function of these three enzymes. I am not going to ask you what are the products of a breakdown of hydrogen peroxide by catalase. Do not worry about it. But you have to know that catalase and peroxidase neutralize hydrogen peroxide and superoxide dismutase neutralizes superoxide anion. Is that clear for you? So peroxidase and catalase right here in the table they neutralize hydrogen peroxide while catalase sorry why superoxide dismutase neutralizes superoxide anion. Now a little note based on my previous experience. We call enzymes a certain way because that name of an enzyme reflects its function. So please do not invent new enzymes. Okay. If you see something that is familiar, but you know that it's not exact, name like um, John and James they like sound similar, but people who have these names are probably different people. Does that make sense? So if you see something familiar, but it's not exact, what does it tell you? That's not it. Do not invent new enzymes, please. Okay, we're clear? So let's go back to these enzymes. <clears throat> Basically, the idea is these enzymes are necessary to survive in the presence of oxygen. So aerobic microorganisms have these enzymes. Obligate and facultative, obligate aerobes and facultative anaerobes have peroxidase, superoxide, dismutase, and catalase. Obligate anaerobes have none. And that explains you why oxygen is sufficient in killing them. Does that make sense to you? Now, what about aerotolerant anaerobes? Aerotolerant anaerobes have superoxide dismutase. And I told you before, look, superoxide anion, this molecule here in the left bottom corner, is notoriously active and terribly toxic for bacterial cells. So aerotolerant anaerobes have an enzyme to neutralize the most dangerous chemical. They can deal with hydrogen peroxide sort of. Does that make sense to you? You understand what I'm saying? So like, yeah, hydrogen peroxide, yeah, we can tough it out. You see? Now, why pay so much attention to this? There are two fairly similar microorganisms that can be often isolated from the same environment of the human mouth and or upper respiratory tract. We encountered them both before. It's staphylococci and streptococci. And you probably remember that Staphylococcus aureus can cause rhinitis and sinusitis, infection of the upper respiratory tract. And so can streptococcus. Streptococcus pyogenes or streptococcus pneumonia can be isolated from the human pharynx. Remember, we talked about pharyngitis, strep throat. So they grow, the appearance on the agar plate is very similar. Can you use something? you know, cheap and easy and fast to tell them apart if you take a throat swab and put it in the guard plate? The answer is yes. It turns out that the filococci, being facultative anaerobes, 
have an enzyme called catalase. While streptococci don't have this enzyme. Now here's what you can do. Look at the reaction at the left bottom corner. Catalase breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. You with me? So you take a microscope slide, put two drops of hydrogen peroxide, 3% hydrogen peroxide, on that microscope slide, and then you simply collect the sample of bacteria from a colony and mix it. Mix two different colonies into hydrogen peroxide. If your microorganism is catalase positive, you will see bubbling. That's oxygen. If it catalase negative, there will be no bubbles. Does that make sense? We're going to do this test on Thursday when you will get the results of today's lab. Are we clear? Mm -hmm. yep. So that brings us to the conversation of that one of these Goldilocks, Compilobacter species, uh, mainly Compilobacter jejuni. It belongs to the order of gram-negative epsilon proteobacteria. You don't need to know the taxonomical order. I'm not going to ask this. And it's a causative agent of the acute enteritis. In fact, it's the most frequent cause of bacterial enteritis in the United States. Compilobacter jejuni is microaerophilic. You know what it is, right? Requires very specific oxygen concentration to grow. And on top of that, it's capnophilic. Loves CO2. Requires a specific concentration of carbon dioxide to grow. You following me so far? So it's microaerophilic, capnophilic rod that causes bacterial gastroenteritis. Another condition associated with Compilobacter jejuni is Kilian Barre syndrome. It's an autoimmune disorder in which your immune system produces antibodies to the pathogen. But these antibodies turn out to be specific against your own tissues as well, specifically against nervous tissue, and people develop paralysis due to the neuronal demyelination. Um, it's not MS, it's slightly different. Turns out guillain barre syndrome in most cases is reversible. So people may develop, you know, um, paralysis or usually part, not paresthesias, and then they will eventually recover and become better. But in some cases, the neurological consequences remain for life. Does that make sense? So what is the main source of Compilobacter jejuni traditionally? It's a zoonotic disease that can be ingested with a contaminated poultry milk or water. Luckily for us, Pasteurization gets rid of Compilobacter jejuni just as it gets rid of many other bacteria. So if you buy pasteurized milk, you're safe. If you decide that you want to go back to 18th century and buy it on the farm, you're more than welcome, but you got to embrace the consequences. Okay. Person-to-person uh, -person transmission is rare. Because basically, transmission has to be fecal oral, and the, con the amount of bacteria that are passed in feces is just not sufficient to. The infectious dose is pretty high. Does that make sense? You have to consume a lot. Now, <clears throat> it turns out that we have quite a few Compilobacter species in the human oral cavity. And there is more and more evidence 
these microorganisms, in some instances, we don't know how, we don't know why, but these microorganisms may actually get into the intestines and, you know, make people sick with gastroenteritis. Does that make sense? Now, the most recent outbreak originated in the state of Ohio and was associated with a pet store puppies. It came from puppies. People were, like, you know, handling puppies in a pet store and they got sick and it spread all over the country. There wasn't too many cases, but, you know, still. Now, every time you look at the any sort of an outbreak, always remember that, say, here, it shows October. This column shows October, and we're talking about, it's probably 21 person. So what does that mean? It means that there was a certain number of people that came to the hospital with the complaints about fever, diary, and vomiting, right? Out of that certain number of people, 21, were clinically diagnosed with Campylobacter jejuni. Is that the actual number of people infected? Absolutely not. This is why I tell you in the beginning of the semester, you know, when you're sick, when you're stomach sick, chances are you're not going to any hospital. You just stuff it out at home in most cases. That's what people do. So I don't know what is the multiplicate is here. You know what I'm talking about? So that 21 people, does it represent 100,000 maybe? Folks that actually got infected, got from mild gastroenteritis to moderate to severe, and only ones with severe or folks who are hypochondriac went you know, to the hospital. So you have to keep it in mind when you look at the epidemiological data, which actually presents number of diagnosed cases. Yeah, probably so. Contamination, yes. Most likely. So, yeah, dogs are not cleanest animals at all. Now, pH requirements uh, for growth, uh, that's pretty simple. That's actually, like, um, I can tell you there will be one question about pH requirements. It's a terminological question on the exam, and it's basically I give you a free point because if you don't know that, this is terrible, sad. Look. There are three types of microbes. One is neutrophiles around here. The majority of microbes are neutrophiles. They grow at the neutral pH. Does that make sense? The overwhelming majority of pathogens are neutrophiles. Why microbes do not like basic or acidic environments? So, acid. Acids can denature and actually break down hydrolyzed proteins and lipids. And acids can break down hydrogen bonds, which will, as you can imagine, affect the structure of what? What hold hydrogen bonds? What do they hold together? DNA, they also hold together proteins. Okay. Now, bases are sometimes considered even more challenging for as a survival environment. There is a cellular process that critically depends on hydrogen ions. We talked about it like a couple of weeks ago. It's the diffusion across the ATP synthesis, yes. Bases will deprive bacteria from hydrogen ions, will neutralize it, and practically shut down the um, cellular respiration. Now, microorganisms that can survive at the acidic environment, called acidophiles, okay, 
Uh, you encounter them in your food. Lactobacilli are acidophiles, microorganisms that carry out fermentation and then thrive in acidic environment of the foods like sauerkraut, yogurt, are acidophiles. Okay. Now you can imagine, you know, we the humans knew fermentation for a long time. And the actual reason for it, think about it, no fridges, no ice chests. So the only way to store food, well, two ways, to dry it out, which we're going to talk about, or ferment it. So food will actually, you know, the nutrients will be stored in that acidic environment that will inhibit the growth of the vast majority of pathogenic bacteria. Does that make sense to you? Now, um, there are some pretty extreme um, acidophiles. The archaea sulfolobus that we mentioned before, this microorganism can oxidize hydrogen sulfide, producing sulfate, was isolated from the geysers in the Yellowstone National Park, and it thrives in the pH 3, pouring juice. Um, ferroplasma, as you can guess from the name, was isolated from the copper mines sewage. Now, pH 1 is the normal environment. If you will bring ferroplasma to a neutral pH, it will die. Interesting feature of ferroplasma. It seems that ferroplasma can reduce copper that is abundant in that sewage. When copper is being mined, there are a lot of chemical processes, and the good mm -hmm. chunk of copper is lost. So there are works to use ferroplasma to basically precipitate copper out of that sewage, which A, makes sewage less toxic, B, gives you an additional so source of copper, which is you know, pretty expensive. Now, alkaliphiles prefer elevated pH. The human pathogen that is mild alkaliphile is Vibrio cholerae. So, when I say mild alkaliphile, I refer to pH of about 8. Vibrio cholerae, as other Vibrio species, commonly grow in the seawater or brackish water. Um, bacteria and archaea that can be found in the Lake Natron in Tanzania, given it the red-pink color, are actual hard coral califiles living at the pH of 11, 12. Okay. Does that make sense? So you have to be able to match the pH requirement and the name. That's as far as it goes. So temperature requirements. So we're going to start from the lower range of the spectrum and we move up with the temperature. Psycro files. Microorganisms that grow at the low temperature. They can grow at zero degrees Celsius and the optimum temperature for growth is lower than 15. Um, a disclaimer, there will be no question that include any of the numbers. Am I clear? You will not get a question. The optimal temperature for growth of a psychrophile is 4 degrees, 5 degrees, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Does that make sense? You have to basically know. So psychrophiles will grow in the snow. There is a psychrophilic algae, which species name, I'd be honest, I don't remember. Uh, but sometimes it can grow in the snow and give it pinkish or reddish hue. Okay. That makes sense? Now, look. There were microorganisms. Have you heard about Lake Vostok in Antarctic? So Antarctic is a continent, right, that is covered with about two miles of ice. And Lake Vostok was discovered several years ago, it's a giant lake inside the ice, which seems to originate at like millions, 
tens of millions of years ago. And the international team of scientists was drilling to the Lake Vostok to take samples. It's a pretty challenging story because uh, you have to make sure that when you get there, actually get there, everything is absolutely sterile. You can't afford to contaminate the sample. They managed to do that. They took the sample. Guess what? It's in the ice. It's in the freaking ice. They found bacteria there, replicating bacteria. And they don't really know the generation time, but it seems like generation time is about two years. So they like divide every two years because nutrients are practically gone, like very few of them. But I think it's so it shows you that it can grow at pretty low temperature. <coughs> now, psychotrophs, this comes more clinically relevant. Psychotrophs usually grow at the room temperature or higher, but the important feature is that they can grow, albeit slowly, at the fridge temperature, 4 degrees. Species like Bacillus, different species of Pseudomonas, have you heard the name Listeria? You may have, because Listeria contributes greatly to the gastroenteritis in adults. Listeria is another example of a psychotroph that can slowly grow in the fridge, essentially spoiling the food. However, the majority of clinically relevant microbes, human pathogens, are mesophiles, meaning that they have an optimal temperature at about the temperature of the human body. Bless you. I mean, we can start with examples and just keep going. Now, can microorganisms grow at anything hotter than human body? Absolutely. Thermophiles, like this microorganism, Thermus aquaticus, <coughs> have an optimal pH, uh, optimal temperature of growth closer to 80 degrees Celsius. Um, in fact, for um, Thermus aquaticus, it's even higher. It seems like it's between 80 and 90 degrees Celsius. It was isolated. Uh, from Yellowstone State, one of the geysers, Yellowstone State Park. So bacteriologists basically scraped some of the um, sediment on the edge of the, the pit, you know, got this microorganism out. That's not it. There are hyperthermophiles. They grow in the boiling water. Like this, I think it's like the coolest combination of the colored scanning electron micrograph and the name. Well, obviously, you have to understand bacteria do not have a color. They're too small for, for having a color. So this picture on the number two, it's colored micrograph. But I think representing archaea with the name Pyrococcus furiosus in the red color is absolutely ingenious. Okay, so this thing grows in the boiling water. Imagine how hard it is to culture it because at this point, agar is liquid. There's a guy in Portland State University, um, Kenneth Stedman, who studies bacteria that live in the like hot springs, and I listen. I don't remember a lot, but I listened to his interview, and he said that it's extremely challenging to grow them. In like, if you have an incubator set for seventy degrees Celsius, and you're trying to find an appropriate medium to grow, because nothing stays solid if you want to isolate colonies. It's extremely hard. Now again, um, I'm not going to give you numbers. Don't memorize numbers, but have an idea. If I tell you, you know, boiling water, that should be something thermophilic. If I tell you fridge, that should be psycho something. And I will not ask you to select whether it's thermophile or hyperthermophile. Am I clear? You will not get those two answers on the same list if one of them correct. 
It may be all wrong. Well, maybe I'm talking about cyclophile. Let me sort of mind that. Got it? Now, what else can influence bacterial growth? Um, so let's talk about osmophiles first. So the majority of microbes grow in the solutions that are either hypotonic, like pond water, or isotonic. Say, you know, human, freely isotonic to bacteria. Does that make sense? Osmophiles can grow at... Now, look, I have to take the blame. Osmophiles don't grow in the hypertonic. They grow in the hyper osmotic environments meaning the concentration of solutes in the environment is extremely high now what can these solutes be there is a fungus a yeast called saccharomyces rausei it's a, a relative of the baker's yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae that can grow at the water activity of 0.62. Now, that's a new unit that you, I don't know, you may have never encountered before. It's a pretty convenient way to compare different concentrations. Of it. Solutions with different osmolality. So, pure water. Pure water has the water activity of 1. Is that clear? When you start to add solutes to the water, water activity starts to decrease. Am I clear? The more solutes you dump in the water, the lower water activity is. Water activity of 0.62 if it's if sugar was added it's basically a syrup does that make sense yes lower the more solutes lower water water activity so i i cannot even imagine what is the water activity of the dead sea because of the sheer concentration now let me ask you this Do you use, do we as humanity use sugar to preserve foods? Yeah. Come on, jam, preserves, all these jellies. This, this is right here. We create a hyper osmotic environment. Bacteria cannot grow in such enormous concentration of sugar. Does that make sense? When I was a kid, uh, we used to, um, you know, collect berries, like wild berries. And you bring them home, and the best way to store them, you just mix berries and sugar one to one. Like one pound of berries, one pound of sugar. Blend them in a can in the fridge. At the room temperature, yeah, they're, you know, that yeast, Saccharomyces rausei, probably fermented. But in the fridge... You can store it for a year. Nothing's going to happen to it. So sugar provides a pretty good way to conserve and preserve the food. Does that make sense? And so, does that make sense? And so does salt. Uh, the, generally, if you think about it, we use salt to preserve food. Um, salted pork was the main diet of British sailors in the 18th and 19th century. Obviously, you know, if, if you on a sail ship, there is no way to install it. In 19th century, there were no fridges, okay? So they had barrels with the salted pork. It doesn't mean that it tasted well or it didn't rot, but at least it didn't rot fast enough to, you know, for sailors to be absolutely hungry, they could still eat it. It was edible, more or less. Okay, salt preserved 
the food. And we still do it today, you know. When we pickle, we add salt to massive amounts, we reduce bacterial growth. Does that make sense to you? However, there are microorganisms that can grow in the presence of high salt. We call them halophiles. Now, I want to make it really clear. So, if we talk generally about growth in the presence of solutes, we call these microorganisms osmophiles. Does that make sense? Osmophiles. If we talk specifically about salt, we can call them halophiles. So, all halophiles, all halophiles belong to asmo osmophiles. It's a special case. Is that clear? Now, um, we can find halophiles amongst the clinically relevant microbes, like Staphylococcus, it's halophilic bacteria, and various haloarchaea can be basically spotted from the, you know, bird's eye view when you fly over the San Francisco Bay and look at the evaporation ponds. And in fact, look at these ponds. You see green, beige, red colors. Those are different evaporation ponds. And what do you think is different between them? Exactly, salt concentration. You can practically monitor the salt concentration based on the color. Because at different salt concentrations, different species of halarchia will survive, giving the pond different colors. Does that make sense to you? There are even obligate halophiles that can grow at extremely high concentration of sodium chloride. The fungus Wolimia ichthyophaga grows at the concentration of sodium chloride at about 1.5 molar. Um, we calculated it once, so 56, 19. So think about this. Uh, it's about a tablespoon of salt per cup of, cup of water. That's pretty salty. If you ask me. Okay. Does that make sense? Now, barophiles. Well, we're getting into exotic stuff. Barophiles. This is a barophile. That's bacteria isolated from the Mariana Trench. I have no clue how they brought it to the surface. Okay. The exper experiencing such a low pressure must have been challenging. So barophiles can survive at extremely high pressures. Zero files. Dry environments. Deserts. This Trichosporinoides nigrescens fungus, those are usually fungi or archaea. Uh, they are more resilient than others. Can survive at extremely dry environments. Honestly, my favorite, the badass, is Danococcus radiodurans. So this, uh, look at the picture number two. Really, it's quite unremarkable, in my opinion. So, you know, dividing cocci, that's all you see. So you have septum, you have two cocci. So what? I want to ask those scientists that sampled water from the cooling circuit of nuclear power plants. The water is basically boiling there in the pipes. They collected a sample and they found this bacteria. It can survive boiling water. It can survive oxidizing agents like hydrogen peroxide, it's like nothing. Um, it can survive pH of 2. As far as I remember, it was sent to the uh, International Space Station and it was exposed to, like, you know, space 
brought back, kept dividing. Um, it can expose, it can be exposed to acute ionizing radiation in a dose of 5,000 gray, which is 5 million times more than chest x-ray. Human dies after the exposure of 5 gray. Now, it's acute exposure, meaning that, you know, if you will keep blasting this microbe with 5,000 gray, it's going to die. But I don't know what's going to happen to a human body if you blast a human with 5,000 gray. It's probably going to just disintegrate immediately. Okay? So that is a pretty tough... And since then, there were other species discovered in those, in those circuits, which for me is extremely, extremely exciting. Now, we're going to take a break. Okay? Now, the plan for today, 